Good morning, good morning. Beautiful sunshine today. Look at that. We got the sun shining right down this street. Our street is not east and west, actually. When we look up that alley across the street, past the cones there, that's north-south. But that's at an angle to our street. We're at about, I don't know, we're, we're uh, west-northwest when you look up the street towards Donkey. And I see the cones are not quite aligned. Maybe that's my fault, actually. When I came down this morning on the way to the pool, the cone you see closest to us, it was kicked over and lying on its side. Somebody last night on their way home from one of the bars must have uh, had a little go at it, bumped into it or whatever. So I picked it up and replaced it this morning. I didn't think about alignment. It's random, but uh, we're almost lined up. Beautiful, beautiful sunny day here. It was a mixed weekend. There was some rain, gusts, and stuff over the weekend, but now it's uh, beautiful and sunny. You know the plan for today. I was thinking there could be other work that was going to interfere, and there is still some other work waiting, but I wasn't able to get that organized by now. So it'll have to be carving. <laughs> it'll have to be carving for at least one more session. So you can blame the drunk last night for the for the lack of calibration on the cone if you like. I'm gonna push it in and pull it out. You see I got some more done bit by bit by bit. I've been working on this, you know, on, on other than screen times. Where are we? Get some light on the scene. The first guy, you know, we finished him quite a while ago. Been moving along with this kimono. Chewing away bit by bit by bit. Maybe this morning we'll work on his hand or just work my way through the kimono. Then we'll go around the neck and start the middle guy. It's November 27th. The, the original target for getting this block finished had been the end of November, but I've got lots of leeway. The print isn't supposed to be shipped till the first week of January. January 1st is our nominal shipping date, but January 1st being New Year, there'll be no staff here and no post office. So the first shipping of the year won't happen until around the 5th or the 6th, which gives me an extra few days anyway. We're okay. No panic yet. No panic, says he, panicking. No, no panic yet. Let's start here. Push in. I did get a bit of work done yesterday, the shop. The shop was fairly quiet yesterday. Mm, I can't say quiet, but it wasn't chaos yesterday, I guess is that what I mean when I say it was quiet. It was a busy day, but not chaotic. It's back, it's the last four days, one by one by one, has have decreased. And this is the pattern now. End of November, the autumn peak season, we're clearly past the peak, even though the maple leaves haven't hit really here in Tokyo yet. But our autumn travel season is now past the peak. And we're sliding down now. The first couple of weeks of December will be pretty slow. And then there'll be another mini peak, people who travel for the Christmas, New Year season. But the next couple of weeks will be slow. We all have a chance to do, do some backup work and get caught up. Tom's asking, is the paper out? Uh, I took the paper out for three people and I shouldn't have. Uh, no, I took it out for Ayumi-san, who is still working on the Yoshida boats. And I got an email from her just a few minutes ago saying, I'm not able to make it. The child can't go to the daycare center because there's a fever is 30 something. So when the stream's finished, I have to go back upstairs and put her paper back in the freezer. Ishikawa-san's working. She is now finished. She's tying up today. She's putting her name on the uh, Dracula print and she's starting a new batch of crow on Shrine Gate. She finished some, you saw it. I showed you here not more than, what, three weeks ago. She's starting another batch of Crow on Shrine Gate. And who else? Uh, Yuki-san's here. She's doing something. I can't remember. Sensei Margin's here. Relatively small amount of yellow red leaves. I guess they're, they're heading south, so maybe you're, you're just too soon for this, or, or the leaves are too late. Where are you at? 
finally saw some around Kyoto. So you're done. Are we done, Sensei? I wasn't keeping track. I, w I checked in a couple of days ago. You were in Yokkaichi. Are you finished? Home, Sanjo Ohash yesterday. There you are. Congratulations. Every time I checked in with you, all I saw was trucks, 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 trucks going by. <laughs> I don't know if you've had fun or not. How much was much of this recorded? Is there a highlight reel coming up on YouTube? Let us know. Thank you, sir. Sanjo Ohash yesterday. So you didn't walk home. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have thought you'd walk home, but uh, whatever. So it's over. My apologies not to keep a bit more contact with it, but uh, what can I say? What can I say? <laughs> well, the Kodama is so slow you could have beat it home. <laughs> That's not what they said in 1964. But, uh... Cool to see that done. Interesting. Because of the trucks, I'm not sure that's a thing I would like to try myself. But the idea of doing that, setting the goal and going out there and, and doing it, pulling it off, thank you very much. That's really nice. Nice to see. I think there had been some concern early on when you were around Hakone, your feet were uh, were cutting out on you, and we were thinking, is he actually going to be able to do this? Well, congratulations, sir. I think I could just for fun here, I could probably make an offer. Nobody would get upset if I do this. Sensei Marjan, next time you're in town here, when you come by, it's up to you. Uh, let's let's say uh, two. Uh, go to the Tokaido shelf, pull out two, and it's our present to you for, for doing this thing, for doing the Tokaido and pulling it off. So pick any two of the Tokaido prints. I can't give you a full set, that's too much. Pick any two of the Tokaido prints, and that's our gift to you for doing this. Is that okay? <laughs> With one condition, there's got to be a story. If you pick two, two, two prints of specific locations, there's got to be a story. <laughs> for each one. <laughs> the sets are expensive, you know, because whatever, because the sets are expensive, because 55 prints, you know. Actually, the, the, what was I going to say? I was going to say cheapest. It's still not cheap. The, the least expensive way to get a full set of really, really good Tokaido prints is a really nice postcard edition. Again, not, this is not a sales talk, but just so we know, there, there are postcard sets here. We've got Takamizawa sets. We've got the Fujisawa Mankado set. That's actually the least, uh, you don't need to spend $2,000 to get one of those. But uh, anyway, for what it's worth, next time you're in, the offer is there on the table if you'd like. So if you want a couple of them, no problem from Mokohankan.
Also, Mr. Marjan, you're here in Japan. You speak Japanese. If you are looking for a Tokaido set, the best thing is not to talk to me. You know what Yahoo Auctions. And you can get out there and uh, find some stuff, you know. If you want to think about doing that, chat with me first because I can warn you off some stuff and show you what might be useful out there. There's so many more Tokaido sets on auctions every day. We can't possibly even think about uh, bidding on a fraction of them. We ourselves just try and bid on the ones that we think are really nice, really special, or will be useful for us in the shop. But there are, what can I say, three, four, five, six, seven Tokaido sets on auctions here any given day of the week. So if you were looking for a set, chat with me next time you're here and I can show you what kind of things to look for. Can we get any closer? I'm not sure. <laughs> I get two for free and hooked for the rest. These aren't cigarettes, you know, these are woodblock prints. <clears throat> Dave, you should take me up on that bot idea. I don't remember the conversation, I'm sorry. You'll have to remind me about that. Okay, today's schedule and what we'll be doing here, I know the stream today is going, of course, yeah, as you can see now, it's going to be carving. I have nothing, nothing, no other activity planned. Uh, because this is Monday, I guess perhaps I know some will drop in for a few minutes on our way upstairs. We have a show and tell, and actually that might, let's, let's uh, think about this. I have a small folder of prints here behind me prepared for show and tell. It's not actually all that exciting, it's just a little touch up and a little bit of uh, replay on something we saw earlier. But then a few minutes ago, just before the camera went live here, I was back from the pool getting set up. The delivery driver dropped off another big box. There's a big box on the other side of the room there. And I mean big. It's one of the biggest packages we have ever received here. And I know what's inside, and it might be fun to peek it and look at it. But it's way too big to put up on my desk here, so... Think about Plan B if I rotate the camera around. Anyway, that might be a that might be a more fun show and tell than the thing I had thought about showing you. So let's see. I won't be able to open the box on my desk. I'll have to roll the camera around and open it down on the floor. So. But it will be fun to look at. It shows you some of the things that were available years ago. So. So let's think about that at show and tell. There have been a lot of print package deliveries, you know, uh, stuff from, from open auctions, uh, stuff from our dealer network. And uh, because the past few weeks, the past couple of months has been so stunningly busy in the shop, both sides, it's been busy for the prints we publish ourselves and it's been busy for what we're calling our flea market, which in retrospect was not really a good name but can't be helped now but that's been so busy and that I can fix a bit because I can try and buy more stuff 
And there's an easy way to get more stuff, and that's simply to bid higher prices in the various auctions. And that's got a, a, a benefit and a downside. The benefit is we get lots more stuff available in the shop, more variety, different kinds of things. The downside, of course, is to get that stuff, I've had to bid more than what I would have at some uh, previous time. So. So I don't really know what to think about that. Am I helping inflation? Am I doing the wrong thing by forcing prices up? Am I the one who is forcing prices up? I don't think so. I think it's the demand. You know? If I don't pay that higher price in the auction, then the print goes for a lower price. Somebody else gets it. We don't have it. People come in the shop and say, that's nice, and they walk out. Who is the one that is causing the price increase? Is it me or is it this this thing not blamable on a single person, this thing called demand? I really don't know. I, I know how it works when you talk about economics 101, but I really don't know how it actually is all working. You know? I think at the end of the day, it still comes down to the person in the marketplace, the person in the shop. If I've gone ahead and done this, bid more for that particular print, I thus put it in the shop and the price is now higher than what it would have been otherwise. People pick it up. And at that point, that's where the price gets set. They either put it down or they walk to the counter and they say, I'd like to take this home. So I guess my my very much layman's understanding of this, it's the shoppers who are setting the prices, I guess. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. It's not like everybody that comes in here is just wildly throwing their money around. This is not true. There are many, many people. And this is a bit of sadness to me. I sit here at my bench here yesterday, chat with some people. Other people just come in the shop. And they maybe come in as a couple, whatever. I can hear them talking, whatever. And there are many, many, many cases each day when there are people who pick up some stuff and look at it and put it back and the two of them will talk for a minute and out they go. And clearly the object was too expensive. I can't really be responsible for everything there. Uh, the Ukiwe Heroes Prince, they're here next to me. And that's the one I most commonly hear, people who are game fans. But once they see the price, it's, oops, can't do that, and out they go. And I'm not guilty about that because we've priced those things very much based on our production costs what it costs. So this is not being priced at what the market will bear. This is being priced uh, absolutely on production costs. The used part of our shop is not. That's all market forces because now it's nothing to do with production costs. The prints were made decades ago.
this row of little uh, brush strokes that we did, it changed part way along, you know, the brush strokes, the head and tail, head and tail, then it switched and head and tail, head and tail, head and tail, then right here again it switched, head and tail, head and tail, head and tail. And really quite funny, should I have just done them all with the same orientation? They started with the heads inside, the tails outside. But part way along there were three, four of them in a row here, which had the head outside and the tail inside. So I copied what was there. You know, we made these decisions back when I was tracing. So Dave here is not going to switch up, switch things around. But maybe we talked about this. Maybe when we were tracing here, I said, look at this. The middle four have the heads on the other end. I don't remember, or I just, just traced it and passed on. Should we move on to? I'm not really interested in just doing all these little triangles on screen. I'd rather do something that's a little bit nicer to look at. So. good. Does working in a high detail piece make my hands sore? No, not at all. Oh, no. Not at all. Not at all. There's no, oh, no. There's no great strength being, being moved here at all. I oh, know. Oh, the wood is hard, but I'm not applying any large amount of strength. It's all restrained, very, very much restrained. Not sure what analogy I could give that would match somebody else's life. You know, a very sharp knife cutting a very small object. Do I need to be careful? Yes. Would there be any reason for my hands to get sore? No, I don't think so. The only time I would feel it physically in this work is when there's a lot of the persuading going on. Then, of course, you're using your body. And because I don't do persuading so much every day, that does sometimes. You're using muscles that sort of don't get exercised every day. And if I was doing a bunch of persuading all at one time, that will get, uh, you know, I will feel it. And feel it the next morning, I will feel it. But work like this, there's no... Uh, no physical strain whatsoever. Just peaceful, quiet work. Work, I don't know, whatever the word we're going to use. Peaceful, quiet activity. Somebody's got a tool or a cleaner or something out there. There's a wine coming down the street from somewhere. 
polishing floor, vacuuming something. I don't know if there's a... I think you can probably hear it on the outside camera. It's the eyes more than anything else, you know. If I didn't have this microscope, there would be a huge amount of strain involved here right now. Well, I say that, but actually not so, because I wouldn't be doing this if this scope or a large lens weren't available to me. There's no way I would be doing this work. It would now be impossible. That was driven home to me a few days ago. I don't know. Did we talk about this? I don't remember. It was, you know, whatever, a week or so ago. I was in the shop here doing a bit of this carving, chatting with people, and Ishkao-san came down from upstairs. And she wanted an adjustment on the block she had. And she had thought maybe that we should carve a little bit more, but it turned out that no, we thought maybe the best adjustment was to do with the, with the corner registration mark. And to put one of the little shims, we call kuiki, a little tiny wood shim that gets driven into the corner registration mark. It's a trivial piece of work for a printer. You got a little bits of wood in your desk by the side. You take your knife, you put a, you just pop your knife into the wood, tap in a little shim, and slice it off. It takes about 30 seconds, 60 seconds. A printer does this all the time, every time you need to adjust your blocks. So if that had been her diagnosis upstairs, she would have done it herself. But she wasn't sure if it was a block adjustment, a little bit of recarving, or if it was a shim. So she brought it downstairs, because if it's block recarving, the printers don't want to do that so much themselves, because they don't want to screw up the color blocks. Anyway, long story short, she brought it down, we looked at it, and we decided that it was best to put a shim in. And at that point, what I should have done was just said, okay, that's a shim, away you go. And she would have gone back upstairs, she would have put her shim in, and all would have been right with the world. But Dave, trying to be a gentleman, instead of saying, you do it, Dave said, okay, yeah, yeah, it looks like we need a shim there. Shall I pop one in? Something I have done a million, well, a half a million times, whatever, in my printmaking career. So she said, oh, thank you. Mistake. <coughs> you can't do that under the microscope. You, you need a wider field of view. You need a wider field of action. So I swiveled the scope out of the way, put my glasses on, took them off, put my close-up glasses on, and got to work. It was a disaster. Even with the close-up glasses on, I couldn't see what I was doing. I put my blade in, tapped it, mm, looks good. Tried to put the shim in, oops, bit too fat. Tried to shave it, tapped it again, shaved it, shimmed it, chap. It was chaos, because I couldn't actually even see what I was doing. It's just in the wrong area, you know. I can look at the sky tree. I can see people walking around inside the sky tree, no exaggeration. With the scope, I can see this clear and sharp, like it was the sky tree. But that area close up, just looking at something like this now, this is totally, absolutely blurred. And no matter what I do with glasses, it just doesn't work anymore. So it was chaos. And then what made it even worse is a couple of, Dave's doing something interesting. So a couple of the viewers came over and stopped and watch and whatever. Whatever, it didn't work. So after some point, she just, she just, you know, let's let's put a bullet in this and get out of here to put him out of his misery. And she said, I feel, yeah, maybe should I finish this off upstairs, you know? And I said, yeah, that that will really help you. Let's let's do it that way. I give it to her, and up she goes. And probably ten seconds later, she had it finished, you know. So I went up afterwards at my break or lunchtime, whatever. Went up afterwards. I go in the door and look at her, and she looks at me. I, we don't need to say anything. And I said, uh, thanks for taking over. And she's like, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's part of it. Clearly, without this scope, 
and without the, the other lens that, that I sometimes use here, and without this lens, I would absolutely be finished, retired. Absolutely, I would not be able to do, to even pretend to do this job. So be it. I guess when you think about it, in the old workshops, you know, the, the big gun, the master guy there, the one with the best skills and whatever, as he got older, this must have crept up on him bit by bit by bit, day by day. You know, the older guy getting less and less in, and trying to hide it and trying to cover for himself. And instead of being able to see it, he's just sort of guessing where the lines are. And at some point, it must become too much for the workshop owner and saying, come over to the guy's bench. I know, Dave, it's, uh, it's time we had a talk. <laughs> it must have happened to each and every one of them, you know. What happens now to athletes, you know? With athletes, I guess it's easier because the stats are right there, you know? You can't pitch your strikeouts anymore. You're not hitting anymore, you know? Whatever your game is, it's not looking for you, so the stats aren't there and everybody knows what's going on. But in something like this, where there's no actual stats on the table to show everybody, you know? Boy, oh boy. So for us here now at Mokonka, and for me here at Mokonka, I think it's it's sort of coming into focus now. I'm in the middle of this Hokusai job. This is number seven. We have 12 to do. I'm assigned for a few more. So come, the, come one year from now, at the end of 2024, when we're wrapping up the Hokusai project, it's really sort of looking like that sort of... Either I make a specific announcement or, or, or whatever, and that's it. That was my last, uh, my last public kick at this. And we've got three other carvers, younger carvers here. Chong San from Hong Kong is doing fabulously well. Kawasaki San working for us down in Kobe, and now Taran San, who's coming along very, very well, of course. So it's sort of looking like this is the way it's going to play out. You know? Instead of me mucking along to the point where I just become an embarrassment. Just finish this series and then get busy with, with videos. Yeah, John Scott, I think we've talked about this before too. I, I've mumbled about that before. Dave Bold announces his transition to Sosaku Hanga Prints. For those of you who don't know what John's referring to, Sosaku Prints are what they're called creative. Sosaku is creative construction, creative making. And that's the 20th century printmakers who, you know, make prints. Karen, whatever, here on, on, the, on the Twitch. She's a Sosaku printmaker. And I don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It means that those guys don't have to worry about technique. That's not what we're saying here. Karen makes prints that are very carefully made.
but John's point, in the Sosak world, anything goes. You don't have to be delicate and get the lines all in the right place. You can be as messy and as blah blah as you want, if that's your taste, and that could be acceptable in the marketplace. That's what John was trying to say there, make Sosak prints. I could be the next Munakata Shiko, blind and staggering across the block. Except, for that, you need a modicum of creativity. <laughs> that's the word, Sosaku. So whatever. Yeah, it's not bad technique. This is my style, you know. And I've been against that mood and feeling for 71 and a half of the 72 years that I've been alive, you know, not counting the first six months or something. So so John knows he's, he's just laughing about this, you know. You can take the whatever... It's not so easy, you know. Well, that time I tried to do that, those, those nature prints, the My Solitude series, where Dave was going to, you know, he wasn't going to try and make wild Munakatashiko prints. That was never the idea. But the idea was to try doing some original work. And it ended up being the most control freakish job I had ever done in my entire life, you know. I found a way to bring the control back into it, you know. <laughs> that hadn't been the idea, but that's the way it worked out, you know. So, so whatever, it's a joke. Dave can be a so psycho printmaker, but uh, it's really only a joke. No, my strength will, of course, be in the other parts of the work that I'm doing, you know, whatever, managing the business, directing the business, and getting down and telling the stories, making the videos, for which I don't need perfect eyesight.
that's still one of my main failings. I still cut too deeply much of the time. Lots of discussion here. Good. Thanks for the other people, the mods and whatever, coming in with the questions. Thanks very much. You know, it's so nice having these uh, these three mods here and other members who can answer so many questions, you know. If I was trying to answer every question by myself, it would just be impossible. Nothing would ever get done. So this is very much appreciated, guys. Thank you very much. You know. I could even say nothing. I could have a silent stream and it would all be acceptable because... Uh, so many people answering questions. Wonderful, wonderful. So I'm saying, why is the neck so long? We can't overthink this. Hokusai was either completely by imagination or picking up on legend that he had heard somewhere. He was trying to depict people from some far off and distant and strange land. Here be monsters kind of a thing. And it might have been just his imagination or these ideas could have been out there in the in the culture somewhere there are men with long necks some there there are you know whatever or it could be his his just idea let's show what strange people might exist in other places we don't know but i'm, I'm thinking there's certainly no psychological meaning behind these things you know I guess somebody's mentioned there's yokai there are there were long necked uh, bizarre characters in japanese culture slash legend. <clears throat> so he's just picking up on that idea. I think it would be a mistake to overthink this and to imply other other motivations or other characteristics. And he was just the kind of guy who would draw and sketch and depict everything. And this particular assignment seems to have been just reach to the ends of the earth and show us things from everywhere. The characters we see in some of the other scenes here are characters from Chinese history. Half of them are legend and half of them are real, uh, you know, historical. And there doesn't seem to be much, uh, much delineation between the two.
It's related on a topic to this. You know, recently here, the Tokaido, Hiroshige's Tokaido, has been a topic, not just here on this stream because of our friend uh, Sensei Marjan's travels the past few weeks, but uh, for us here in the shop, the Tokaido is a major deal. Many people come in looking for those designs. We have many, many, many of them in the shop. Large, we even have large, medium, and small Tokaido. If you want the Hakone print, yes, sir, what size would you like it? Large, medium, or small? I mean, that's the Tokaido is a big, big deal here. And we have some Tokaido prints in our collection website. And recently, Sadako has been helping me by uh, doing uh, little bits of description for those. Our first step for the collection is we just dump the pictures onto the net, and then later on, we sort of get sorted out trying to add more descriptions. And Sadako has been helping me by at least putting minimal descriptions up on those Tokaido prints. Not an essay for each one, but a, a little description. And to help her with that, she's been reading different books about the Tokaido and about what it was like to travel on the road and stuff like that. So that's been in the air at the moment in our discussions. And there are lots and lots of uh, thoughts about this. It comes back to what I was saying a moment ago. Hokusai drew these long-necked men. He, I, I think I can state pretty equivocally that Hokusai never saw a man that looked like this, that this is from something from Hokusai's imagination. So what's the connection with the Tokaido? Well, it's wide open among researchers as to whether or not Hiroshige actually went all the way down the Tokaido, looking at each place, making sketches, bringing them back, and then making the woodblock prints. The original thought among researchers was that, yeah, we have some diary entries that he did. He booked a, a, a place as a member of a retinue that was going down the Tokaido. So there are some diary entries to, to state this. So, okay, the assumption is these are all drawn from real life. Later on, researchers learned that it's not quite that simple, and it's quite probable among those guys that he didn't actually go all the way down. He went way down and then okay I gotta get back home and get it the same going <laughs> for whatever reason nobody knows the reasons so it's very much on the table that the early scenes in Hiroshige's Tokaido are drawn from actual real life but not all of them so what's a guy to do well I can interject one more thing he has a series or he, he designed another series Edo Meisho Hyakke 100 scenes of Edo easy for us to believe that he walked around town seeing those places. No problem. He also did a series called, I think it's, I forget the Japanese title, The 60 Odd Views of the Provinces of Japan. And we know absolutely there's no way he traveled and got permission to travel, which was necessary in the old days, to every five far-flung distant cape and province of Japan. We know he didn't do that. And yet he produced this very interesting series of 60 views from the provinces of Japan in an era when there are no such things as photographs. So how does he do this? You hear stories? Oh yeah, what it's like I heard there's a whirlpool down there. Yeah, oh really? Yeah, okay. I mean you hear stories about this, you have some information about this. You might have some other guy's guidebook who went down there 30 years ago, whatever. And from these bits and pieces and scraps of information, this is your job, you create the image. Well, for us, a landscape view isn't something created. You go there and the mountain is there and it's your job to delineate it. But when you've never been there, there may be mountains, there may be rivers, there may be sea. It's his job to make it up. So if he did do that to us, if he only went partway down the Tokaido, came back, this is not uh, this is not evil. This is not bad. This is not a lie. This is just the way it worked. The best example of this, perhaps, is uh, there's a couple of places. Uh, Kambara is one. There's different towns in Japan with the name Kambara, one of which was on the Kiso Kaido, deep in the mountains, snowy scene. Hiroshige depicted Kambara, which was on the south-facing sea coast, no mountains, very mild, clement weather. And he depicted it with the scene from the wrong Kambara. And it's pretty clear he must have seen an old guidebook and saw the name and didn't understand what he was doing. So how much is real? How much is not real? And does it make any difference? 
a book Sadako is reading right now. I tossed her a book yesterday because she's been interested in the Tokaido. Yesterday, I picked a book up, up off our shelves, passed it to Sadako. This might be of interest. And it's a book about the theory that all of the Tokaido prints by Hiroshige are not original at all, that he copied them from a guy called Shiba Kokan, uh, who used the name of Shiba Kokan. I forget what his real name was. And he came a generation or, or even two generations before Hiroshige. And there are a set of paintings, uh, drawings, pictures out there attributed to him, which have clearly uh, a very, very, very similar design to Hiroshige's Tokaido designs. And the conspiracy theorists are of the idea that these are Shiba Kokan pictures. They do date from pre-Hiroshige. They are the same designs in vertical layout instead of horizontal ergo. Hiroshige saw these and copied them. And the academics and researchers have taken positions, guns on one mountain, guns on the other mountain, and they blaze away at each other, trying to uh, prove who's right and who's wrong. And does it matter? Mm. Did Hiroshige copy those things? Did he make them up? Did he actually originate these? There's no way to really figure this out. And in the, the Japanese tradition here, it doesn't really matter. Plagiarism wasn't, uh, the word would, I can't say it wouldn't have been understood or known, but there was no copyright. There was no sense that everything had to be completely new and original. Remember, students went into a drawing studio or workshop, an art, workshop and just simply they spent all their time copying 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 stuff that was already there that's how you learned your trade anyway to answer the question the long neck man I, I, I forget the question Maybe we should come back to Sensei Marjan. How can you prove that you really did go down the Tokaido? Maybe you stayed in a hotel somewhere and just uh, showed us video.
how's our time? Okay, still must be early, right? 8.55, so we might be getting an Allison in the door if she comes in. Or if she goes upstairs, I don't know. It's Monday morning, she's going to be pretty busy today. So. Oh, 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 good morning. A little bit early. Are you on a different train these days, coming from a different direction? Yeah. Just, uh, I don't know. Uh, compared to metro, there are less uh, trains. So fewer trains. Train. Uh, yeah, so like train, it's gonna be at this less options. Yeah. So. It's Anna here this morning, Monday morning. Oh, yeah, because I'm asked. At least say hello or something. I'm saying, oh, I can't even see myself in the screen, so I can't stop. It's because you're so small, you're back at the top here. So, 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 so. I know, since you guys have moved, how are your weekends? Have you settled into a new routine? Is it all comfortable? or? Still a lot to set to organize, but it's. Bit by bit, it's becoming better. I mean, when you were in the old place, we used to hear stories about you guys went cycling and stuff like that on the weekends. Yeah, are there good cycle routes near where you are? Yeah, by the river, yes. And uh, Taran's hobby now is like uh, running along the river. Like we, there's a cycling course as well, but uh -huh. you can also uh, run around. You mean as in jogging? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? And he's going to yeah. join a, a marathon uh, race in December, and then they do this like monthly. Uh, marathon race like every month so like you can just you know compete your pa past you like from last month oh, you, mean, you mean you mean training like to go in the Tokyo marathon you mean or they actually do a marathon every marathon, month yeah like Akabane marathon thing like every month so it's yeah and there are like two or three different races like every month oh, you mean like a, sh a short one you mean, a, you mean a full marathon type full race? marathon and half quarter okay yeah so yeah, okay. And, uh, so he can work his way yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah you can get your you know your time this month and then you can just you know compete against your past you <laughs> against <and> yourself <laughs> okay, okay i think it's a good motivation though Oh, I know, no argument. Yeah. Dave, Dave's point, you know, I go to this pool every day, but there's no way I time myself yeah, and I try and beat my time because at my stage here, just doing the exercise is more than enough. You know? Yeah, I feel the same. Yeah. I don't run for beating myself mm. or, you mm. know, like becoming better and better, but I run because I want to build up like my stamina yeah. or, you know, something like yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. So, but his case is like he's he more, he, he does care about time as well. He's young, so. he's thir <laughs> young 30 year old guy so of course yeah. it's more i gotta gotta do this better than the other guy or do yeah, it better yeah. than myself okay fair enough so yeah fair what enough. i do is like i cycle when he's running you know it's easier for me because i don't enjoy running that much uh -huh. so cycling uh -huh. you know just you know side by side and he's running Oh, I see so you you go with him but with he runs a new cycle yeah. i get it i get it i get it okay, cycling okay. 
Yeah, it's is very that, slow, but, but it's a shuttle. But is that permitted? Like, aren't the bicycles separated from the area where the runners no, are? It's no. okay? Yeah, it's just a wide, like, big road, so, like... It's okay, there's, plenty, no, there's plenty, no rule about mixing space, cyclists over here, runners no, over here. Plenty of space for, like, anybody. Okay. Is this along the Arakawa River? No. Yeah, Arakawa River. Up at the top, way, way up above yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so you it's can start from, like, really wide. Yeah, really wide. You can start from, like, Kitawa, and then you go through, like, Adachi, I guess, and mm, maybe mm, you can just yeah. Yeah, partially enter Saitama if you mm, want. Mm, mm, so, yeah, it's a long Osaka. course. Uh, so, are you guys going up the river, then, away from here? Uh, it depends. You can choose, like, which way you want to go. Mm. So okay. it's, it's quite yeah. fun. For me here, the Sumida River is here for walking. And if you go up here a couple of kilometers, there's a short hop over to the Arakawa River. But that's a whole different thing. It's way wider. The, the cycle paths and stuff are like 10 meters wide and things. And it's full of like Olympic type trainers going, you know, at the area up where you are, maybe not so much. I don't know. Yes, They're but it's good. just like I said, it's super wide mm. so like you don't care about those people okay. going past okay. and you're okay. still safe you know, so like they are there space. but they keep away from you guys yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. you'll be surprised yeah. how serious they are they are i mean yeah. <laughs> serious of course but serious, that must be yeah. the same as anywhere in the world I mean, yeah. ma, 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 so I mean, i've got that in my pool that today in my lane the speedy young lady she came into my lane today also yeah, this she was first but the lady we're still kind of having trouble with at our pool there's a lady who swims way faster than all of us uh, and she's frustrated because we're slow and we're frustrated because she is fast and she doesn't want anybody in her way. Mm. And today she was in my lane. She went in there first, got my lane, other four it? filled up. Well, knew it's a month or so. The story has I been building bit by bit by bit. So it's not really a good situation because mm. uh, we now we ignore her. <laughs> it, no, no, it, it's difficult. So she was in my lane first, and she's fast, 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 so whatever. But this is my lane. I get in it, and I start swimming, and I'm way slower than her. But because she has been so impolite to us, so unfriendly to us, none of us now, we don't move out of the way. Uh, when I'm with my pace car lady, she gets in first. She's a little bit faster than me, so after 10 or 12 or 14 laps, she's coming up from behind. I quietly stand up, and I even gesture under the water with my hands, dozo, and she turns and goes. We've been doing this for years. This new lady now has been so unfriendly that none of us, not just me, none of us do this. I just swim. I, she's coming up behind me. I just ignore her. I get to the end and turn around. And then she does the churn. She passes me in the lane. Mm, well, how, like, when you're swimming, it's so easy. Swimming, like, how, like, how can you tell that she's being, like, rude or... Like it's, well, at the beginning, it was easy. She slaps your feet at the beginning, you know. I saw this so, guy. So, so, and normally, like me with the pace car lady, from the very, very beginning, as I, I, I know where she is because you can see where the people in your lane are. Yeah. So I know she's coming up behind me. So I stand up and away she goes because we've all been polite to each other. Coming into the pool, we do aisatsu. Ohai gozaimasu toka. This other lady is zero. No aisatsu, no looking, no nothing. Just get out of my way. Hey. So all of us are responding to this by not getting out of her way. So it must be really frustrating for her, but it comes from her behavior. So, so we were talking about this before, and we were a little bit people were worried. David, me, and me, and the other people at the pool we were bullying her, and that's really not the case. We are just doing our normal activity. We want to keep out of her way, but mm. she is she has just made it unpleasant. So. I was curious how much related to what you're doing. You know, out on the river, you don't know who the people are. Just ch 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 yeah, well, by, so you, know, so. yeah, you never get yeah. in trouble like mm -hmm. in terms of the mm -hmm. you know, lanes or like road, mm -hmm. like space. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. oh, so this guy, mm -hmm. is it mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. I assume uh, she moved from one one swim. I guess so. No idea. No, yeah, no. So it's frustrating. So <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's uh, it's settled down to routine now. We don't care, and I guess she just works around us. You know, it's all of us in our lanes, and she's just simply flying around trying to find her space in here. I don't know what the reaction is, what people are talking about here, but whatever. So so anyway, the complex politics of an Isaksa Fitness Club, it's got to be the same anywhere. Absolutely the same anywhere. Absolutely. Uh, the big Chantel. No, I think I'm going to handle this by myself. There's a, they were, Tom was suggesting, today's Chantel is hey. that box. Oh, kiddos, But you know, one idea was to have you stay and help me with this, but it's okay. I know what I'll be doing. I can move it onto the floor and open it up. It's okay. And you are busy. There's a bunch of orders over the weekend. And Monday morning here, all the staff, stuff from over the weekend. So, Anna-san, 
wants to get going on her stuff. It's not chaos. Your box is It's not, not chaos. Today, uh, Otanabe san is sleeping, so I think I'll be so, quiet all day. Yeah, um, yeah. Just so, be stuck yeah, in my room. Keep, so. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, keep out of your way. If there's anything we can do, I think, are we low staff down here too today? It's, uh, uh, don't, well, I haven't heard it's anything. It's Teiko-san, Udagao-san, Miyata-san, but it could be quite quiet here. They've got tons of packing to do. Ah, so it's quite a busy day, but quiet Focus, day, so, focusing so, so. on their work. And, and for me, work. it's uh, it's dosa party upstairs on the third floor, or it was going to be. It was going to be me, Ayumi-san, and Dei-chan. We're going to have a dosa party okay. doing sizing. But Ayumi-chan has cancelled. Her her daughter has oh. a, a, a fever. Okay. And Dei-chan can do it by herself. So I may be actually sitting here carving. I was going to remind you to do the, at the hot spring. Yeah, that's also mm. waiting. So. Uh, it's mm, I know, okay. I, know, I, know, I, know, I know. Yeah. She's got orders for something. You know, when we run out of prints, we sort of want to turn off the orders until we get the prints back. But we've run out of a specific print, and I said, "Okay, I'll have some ready for you next week." So they didn't turn the orders off. So orders are building up for a print that we don't have, and the onus is on me. <laughs> To do this, and one idea was to do it in this morning stream to move upstairs and do it. But I, last night I was too tired. I didn't do the prep, get the paper moist ready, and whatever. Oh, that never and also the stress of printing on a stream, printing a difficult print on stream is. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want that stress. Okay. So here she's finding out right now that I didn't do it yet, and the prints aren't ready. But she has been taking orders for them. Uh -huh. yeah. so anyway, here it is. <laughs> it's, it's me yeah. that has to get this ready now. So. so. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Let's get to work, okay? Yeah, thanks for this. Yep, thank you. Yeah, I'll take care of that. Okay, no problem. Okay. Thanks for dropping in. Saying, well, yep. No, nope, just leave. Just absolutely. Yes, okay. I, know, I know what I'm going to do. It's okay. all set. Okay, thanks, Anna. See you soon. See yep. You soon. Okay. You do a circle swim. Of course we circle swim in the lanes. Absolutely. Nobody's going up, down, up, down, up, down. We're circle swimming inside a lane. And the rule in this club, maybe all the rule, it's counterclockwise. The rule is when there's more than one person in a lane, you circle swim and you do it counterclockwise. And that's me and my pace car lady normally. We do that. The pace car lady wasn't there today. This other woman came in. So me and the fast lady were circle swimming. But she's so much faster than me, she has to also pass me. And when you got three people in a lane, that's not possible, of course. So, <coughs> Anyway, not my problem. I don't want to exaggerate it. It's not like the whole thing is the room is full of stress all the time. 90% of us, we're just doing our normal exercise in a normal way. And this new person simply hasn't found a way to fit in yet. And it's probably not going to be because she's simply so much faster than all of us. This is not the right place to do your Olympic training or your swim club training. This is a fitness center, a bunch of people in the morning trying to get their exercise for the day. We are casual swimmers and that's what that facility is for. So I don't need to make excuses. She's the one who is in the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing. So Anyway, don't sweat it. I, I wouldn't bring it up usually, but it, I, I forget it came up as part of the conversation there. So. So don't sweat it. We are okay at the pool. I'm doing well, getting my exercise, and things are going well for most of us there. What's the time? 9.09. .09. Let's put knife to wood for a few more minutes and then switch to my big box here.
Oh, well, something I didn't mean to chat about this morning was the, the event that's happening in Asakusa. I think I mentioned it to you a few days ago. A Pokemon Go, the company, what is it called? I forget their name. It begins with an N or something. The Pokemon Go thing. There's a massive, massive event happening here in Asakusa. It started the last few days. It runs until December the 10th. And they've built, the Pokemon Go people have built seven courses. These are virtual reality courses. There's nothing on the street that people can see when they walk around. But there are seven courses set up here in Asakusa with uh, Pokemon Go characters and new, what are they called, battle zones? I forget what they're called. And the last few days, it's been insane. The number of people out there. I mean, always we see people walking down the street looking at their smartphone. That's no big deal. Obviously, everybody. People just look at their phone walking down the street. It's insane. Yesterday we would stand outside, would, you know, come outside to the front of the shop and look down. And there's the normal revelers, there's the normal people looking for restaurants. And in and among them, maybe half the people, if I say half, I don't think it is half the people are in groups, one, two, or a family, or a, mom, a bored dad walking with his son who is eagerly looking for the next Pokemon character. And they're following these seven courses all around town here. And in front of the Uniqlo, they've got a giant battle thing set up there and big big posters and campaigns all everywhere. And all the way up and down, uh, uh, not Rock Dory, our street, but all the way up and down Broadway, they've got m massive posters, maybe four meters high, a meter wide, of famous ukiyo-e characters playing Pokemon Go, you know, with their smartphone. These are kabuki things clipped from famous ukiyo-e pictures. And instead of somebody holding a knife, he's holding a, a, a smartphone and he's doing Pokemon Go. It's, yeah, Niantic, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So somebody's saying, smartphone aruki is forbidden. Tell me about it. <laughs> Tell me about it. So, so. No, I'm not interested in Pokemon, not at all. I know when Pokemon Go came out first years ago, we did talk about this because we did. We installed it on our iPad. And the thing about you could see characters and you could take pictures of characters in your own room. I don't know if they still do that or not. And you could take pictures of your, your our, our print party room with a Pokemon character sitting on the bench. And we did. We, we took a bunch of pictures like this. But then the, the, their requirements for playing the game, uh, whatever, you had to register or something. So we, we just quit. But, uh, but anyway, just so you know, this is very much a thing here. Or maybe it's because of the promotion. Or maybe it's dying and that's why they have to do promotions. I don't know the backstory. Just simply here in Asakusa, for, until December the 10th, Pokemon Go is a very, very big deal. And in a bizarre mix of modern and traditional, the company who's doing this promotion, they have hired a couple of Chindonya bands. So for the past few days we've heard it and we'll hear it again today. There's Chindonya bands walking through the neighborhood dressed up as Pokemon characters and playing their little funny soprano saxophone and promoting Pokemon Go. And if, if you, you haven't heard that, you've got a real, a real treat coming. You know. And I didn't, I didn't video any of it yesterday, but there must be some out there on, on YouTube or Instagram. I'll see if I can find a link if somebody reminds me about it. Pokemon Go Chin Donya Asaksa. There must have been people who videoed some of this yesterday. And you haven't lived until you have seen an Asaksa Chin Donya band promoting Pokemon Go. <laughs> You've got to see this. I don't have a phone myself, so I can't easily video these things. But uh, whatever, I guess I should just get one of my video cameras ready. And when I see them coming down the street, try and catch this. You haven't lived until you've heard an out-of-tune C melody saxophone accompanied by a, a, a drummer and then a person playing a, a ching ching bell. Ching 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 ching. It's a treat. A real, real treat. Has somebody got a link? There must be some of this on YouTube or Instagram or something. Okay, show and tell. Let's zoom out. We're going to have to zoom out as wide as we possibly can here. I'm going to have to reduce both cameras. 
and I cannot open this package on the desks here. So here's what we're going to do. I don't think we've ever done this before. Let's do this. Let's turn this camera. There's the base of my tripod. There is a package over there against the wall. And there is the floor. Get my knife. I can't see the chat while I'm doing this, so it's over to you guys. I'll, I'll bring the prints back to my desk to talk about them. I'll get it through the desk first. Get the light out of the way. Oh, we're slowly panning. The cable is pulling it. Okay, I got you. Thank you for the warning. Locked it in place. So the floor is right there. Okay, see you in a minute. Floor cam. Unexpected. I didn't know. Look at this. Very, very sturdy. Beautiful. Beautiful. Kitty box. My god. I'm almost hoping the prints are no good so I can keep the box for myself. How am I going to get this out of here?
exhausted. The thing about these sets, you know, somebody bought this. This is Yamada Shoin. It's a set of ukiyo-e, famous ukiyo-e bijinda. You know, bi bijin, the phrase for, for beauties. Bijin Mei Sakushu Mokudoku, the table of contents. It's published by Yamada Shoin, and this would have come out in the bubble era, maybe late 1970s, beginning of the bubble era. I shouldn't say bubble era. This is before that. This is 1970s. It's a set of 46 prints. We see it on Yahoo auctions all the time, almost always broken up, bits and pieces of it, fox like crazy. I've never, ever seen it in this format before with this beautiful case and a beautiful box. So if this is all in perfect condition, this is staying here in the collection. But as always, once we find out what the prints are like inside, it might be a different story, absolutely a different story. This is quite a nicely made set. It's not the top peak of woodblock printmaking, but these are nicely done. And the men who made this, these are the men I knew. And I knew them at the end of their career, but when they made these prints, like for example, Ito-san, the, the man who was in my Remembering a Carver video. He's one of the main carvers of this set. Koike-san, uh, Kuda-san. These were the men who carved these things. Oh, in fact, right, look at this, look at this. Together with each folder, there's the Japanese description about the two prints inside, and then we have the, the little introduction to some of the craftsmen. So right there at the beginning, they're putting the craftsmen up front and back. I never met this man. This is Maeda-san, the most, most famous post-war carver. Uh, I never met him. He may have still been alive when I got here, but I never had a chance to meet him. I don't remember when he died. His death date will not be on this little sheet of paper. Again, same as with the set the other day, there's no way we're going to have a chance to go through 46 prints. Let's just peek at the first group here and then see what condition they're like. So far, so good. The box looks very nice. It looks like it's been stored in a dry area. Oh, we've got early ones here. They published this series for a long, long, long time. The blocks didn't last all that long. We have an early one. How does Dave know? Look at this. Look at this. The fine lines here. This is Maida San at work. Oops, get back here, Dave. There's your finger for scale. It's not the most magnificent work. If Maida San had really done his job properly, we'd see feathering on the end of the small ones and we would see feathering on the black ones. He hasn't feathered them properly. This could have been done a bit better. But I'm picky, picky, picky. This is 1970. This is not 1790 when this print would have been first designed. These are nicely done. For the era, they are very nicely done. There's no way anybody is publishing work of this quality today. You know, in a, in a, the, the Kumiai people in a set like this. Oh, ho, ho, I knew it was too good to be true. I knew it was too good to be true. Udagawa sung good morning. Sorry about the mess. Sorry, excuse me. I'll, I'll clean it up once the stream is over. I knew it was too good to be true. So here we go. First step, the, the daishi, the packaging is foxed. And what damage do we have? Yep. It's from the print. Look at this. Can we see it? I knew it was too good to be true. Crap. Beautiful packaging. And I have no idea now how many of these 46 prints are going to be usable. <sighs> 
So the, the good news, the bad news. The good news is clearly, good news for people out there is we will not be able to keep this as a full set. Dave is gonna keep that beautiful box and the prints, the ones that are nice, will go as single copies into our flea market and the ones that are not are just simply gonna go. So right there off the top, the first one, boom. There's no way you can pack prints like this, inside paper like this, with no access to the air, leave them alone for 60 years and expect them to be in good condition when you open it up. And you can see the structure. The guy who bought this, the family who bought this back in 1975, whatever it was, they probably looked at it, they probably had some fun with it. It went on the shelf, a month goes by, and then nobody ever looks at it again. You can see why. What are you going to do? You can't even get the box off your shelf. How are you going to look at these things and enjoy them? Oh, it's Ito-san! If you have seen the Remembering a Carver video, here he is in much younger stage. This is Ito Susumu. Started when he was 12 years old. We've got a pocket biography here, stuff that I didn't even know. His father was a carver. I didn't know that. His father was a carver, and at age of 12, he started working with his dad. This is pre-war day. This is long before the war. Ito-san, actually, his, his life was interrupted by the war. He was uh, conscripted and taken out to fight. This is the man. So, so, so. So he did his part. How were the prints? Oh, yeah. This is funny. This is funny. I would never, ever, ever do it this way. Inside this package, some of them are single prints, and some of them are diptychs, and some of them are triptychs. And this is one print from one of the triptychs in the set. In this case, it's carved by Ito-san. He didn't carve the other two. They've done these triptychs carved by different people. It might be Ito-san with the middle one, Koike-san did the one on the right, and somebody else did the one on the left. They made no attempt to uh, keep the collaboration. Look at this, beautiful, clean, and sharp. And our problem now, are all three going to be okay? Because if one of them is foxed, then we have a real problem. We've got a diptych, which isn't really a diptych. Well, here we are, the other one, so. It gives us the information here on who carved which ones. In fact, here we are, right there. Just as I said, these are two of the prints from a diptych. The third one will be farther down in the package here. And this is really not bad news. Here we have. The first carver was Koike-san, the other carver was Ito-san. So two of them, they're carved by different people. And really, it shouldn't make a difference. If the men are both competent professionals, it shouldn't make a difference. Because remember, we're not making prints from the original sketches. These prints are reproductions of woodblock prints. So the thinking and what I'm doing with the Hokusai thing was all done 100 years ago changing the sketch into a print, the originality. Now it's a print, just cut what you see. Cut what you see. These are nice, beautiful gradations. These are nicely done. If it turned out that only that one is foxed, then we will switch and swap. And in fact, that might be what's gonna happen here. What Nabisan and her team are going to go through these and we have other sets of this partially foxed and if she can switch and swap out to make a good clean full set she will do so let's look at one more we can't go through 46 body prints here. here's koike-san this is the third so in the first packages here this is koike-san i met him a couple of times we weren't good buddies i didn't know much about him just I met him at some of the craftsmen's meetings. Mm. 
clean, competent, no foxing. Overall, this is a nice set. This is really a nice set. It's all going to depend how many of them are damaged, how many of them are foxed. And the same thing again. They've done a, he's done a reasonably good job. Actually, he did a bit better than my descent. There's nice feathering on the gray, and there's reasonable feathering on the black ones that match up. This is okay. Nothing to complain about. Absolutely. This is nicely done. If you had this in your own collection, your own home, you could point to this with pride. Beautifully made print. It's really clean and bright. It's done the way that Adachi does it. They made no attempt to make it look old-fashioned. They've done this clean and bright. That's Adachi's philosophy too. Make your reproductions look like the originals. This one too. No foxing, no damage. It could be that we've got a really nice set here. This is supposed to represent a summer kimono, a, a, a transparent kimono with very, very thin fabric. If in summer you're doomed to wear one, two, three, four layers of clothing anyway, you want them to be as thin as possible, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't write home about the printing here. Look at this. Do you see the darker blobs? The places where these things join. And somewhere in the middle here, there's darker blobs. It's careless printing. Somebody has put the sumi pigment on the block and he has not spread it out carefully enough. Look at this. Look, 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 look. Look at this. Light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. He's blocked the sumi on there and gone yak, yak, yak. And the sumi ink is not spread out carefully enough. This is poor quality printing. I'm too picky, I'm too picky, I'm too picky. Whatever, I don't know. Hey, the sounds laughing at me. Okay, let's move on. That's all we got time for. We don't have time to dig through all 46. I, thought, I think it's been useful to you to see this thing, to see this box and to see what this is. This is a typical way that prints were marketed and sold during the latter half of the 20th century. I myself would never do it this way. The product itself just doesn't end up being usable. But whatever, each to his own. Okay, today is Monday. I'll be back here three days from now. You know exactly what I'm going to be doing. Still carving, carving, carving. I don't know if that's a tease, not showing you more prints. We really can't do this. I have to get to work here. I've got to get going. Is that a family? Did the kids have smartphone open? Pokemon Go? No, I didn't see a smartphone there. She's got one. I would have bet that young lady is a Pokemon Go fan, but the family, I don't know. I didn't see. Okay, anyway, time for you to get out of here. Thank you very much, gang. I've enjoyed being here today. I will read the chat later on at lunchtime to see if there's any interesting comments that I need to pick up on. Thank you very much. See you in a few days. Let's take this down. Three, two, one. See you later. Bye for now.